Hey YouTube, in this one, I want to talk about why you might consider using arc slice T instead of vec T as a reasonable default in your Rust code. Now this is a little bit of a hot take, so let me qualify it just a bit. So arc slice T can be a really good choice over vec T for immutable data. So if you build up a big sequence of data that you then never modify again after that, you might consider arc slice T. It's really good for data that you're going to be storing in structs or arrays or collections or just generally passing around. I'm not talking about a vec that you collect real quick as a local variable in a function or just that you use for some quick scratch space. Something that you're going to be storing for a longer period of time, you might consider using arc slice t. And especially for data that implements clone. Now this shouldn't be a huge surprise because clone is kind of the superpower of arc, which we'll talk about shortly here. But if you're going to be cloning big immutable sequences of data around all the time, ARC can really, really speed that up over VECT. Um, if you don't need clone, you can do even better than ARC slice T. You can use box, but we'll talk about that at the very end. So why am I recommending this? Well, there's three really big reasons. The first one we already touched on. So ARC has an extremely cheap constant time clone. So no matter how big your sequence is that you're pointing to, it's going to take the same amount of time to clone it, and it's just going to involve incrementing an integer and mem copying the arc pointer itself, which is very, very fast, and it doesn't involve any memory allocations, which normally cloning a vec does. So this is a huge optimization that you can get very, very easily just by switching over to arc slice t. Another reason is that arc slice t is only 16 bytes. It only needs to store a pointer and a length, unlike a vec, which needs to store a pointer, a length, and a capacity, making it 24 bytes. Now, that's only an 8-byte difference. It's not huge, but if you're storing lots of these things, especially in a struct or in an array, that extra memory can add up, and it can decrease your cache locality, and it can make it harder to walk a big series of these things. And then lastly, the third reason is that arc slice t implements deref slice t, just like vec does. So you can do all of the same read-only stuff on your arc slice t that you can on your vec t. You can ask for its length, you can iterate over it, you can index into it. And this is really important because these first two bullet points are cool, but I wouldn't necessarily go out of my way to recommend them if arc slice t was way more difficult to use than vec is, but it's not because it implements deref slice t. It also implements a bunch of other traits that you're probably going to want. And it makes it so that arc slice t is really just a drop-in replacement for vec t in many, many circumstances. So these first two bullet points are nice performance gains. This third one means it's basically not any harder to use arc slice t than it is vec t. So you might as well just reach for it first. So I've been talking about arc slice t versus vec. I'm actually going to spend the rest of the video talking about arc stir versus string, which is the exact same dichotomy. It's just a little bit easier to talk about and a little bit easier to think of examples of. But everything that I'm going to say about arc stir versus string is going to apply directly to arc slice t versus vec. Now, I also want to mention that anytime you're using arc, you should always try and use rc first if you don't need the thread safety that arc gives you. I'm just saying arc here because it's the most general version of the advice. But if you can get away with rc, you should definitely try because it has lower overhead than arc. Now, I also want to clarify something else. I want to point out that I'm talking about arc stir, not arc string. Arc string actually has some of the same upsides as arc stir, but it also has the very significant downside that you need a double pointer indirection in order to actually get to the data that you care about, which is your character data. I'll show a visualization of this at the end, but arc string is just generally kind of clunky and memory inefficient, and that double indirection is going to be really bad for performance. So I do not recommend using that. I'm talking about arc stir. The power of Rust wide pointers is that we can point an arc directly at a dynamically sized character buffer out on the heap. So let's say that I'm working on a game, and I have a type in my system called monster ID. And under the hood, it's just going to be represented as some text. And I want to use the string type to manage that text for me. So the first thing that I might want to do on my monster ID struct is derive a bunch of traits. I want to be able to clone this thing around. I want to be able to print the debug representation, compare it, hash it. I also want to use surday to do some serialization and deserialization, maybe from a configuration file or just from some save data. So I want to slap all those derives on my monster ID struct, and I want it all to work. And that will work with string. Next, I want to have a method on my monster ID struct that just grabs the underlying representation as a string slice. Maybe I want to log this out to the console. 
maybe I want to use this for analytics somewhere. So I just want to access the underlying data as a string slice. And that's pretty easy to do with string. Next, I want to have some configuration data somewhere. And this is going to be a hash map of monster ID to their stats, you know, their damage, their health, and all that stuff. And it's going to be keyed on monster ID, which is why I needed to derive eek and hash. And this all works just fine with a string as an underlying data type. Next, I want to store these things in a big list of all of the enemies that I've ever spawned. Notice that I'm using vec here because this is going to be something I'm going to be appending to as the game runs. And I'm probably going to be cloning monster IDs into here. And this list could get fairly large, and it's going to be a bunch of these monster IDs sitting right in a row. Next, I need some kind of functionality for creating an actual enemy that I'm going to use in my game based on a monster ID. So I'm probably going to be cloning monster IDs into this function, maybe cloning monster IDs into the enemy instance so that each enemy instance knows which monster it is. And lastly, let's just say I'm storing some stats in a B-tree map that's my monster ID to the number of times I've destroyed that monster throughout my gameplay session. And I'm just using B-tree map here as a different type of data structure than hash map. And we can use monster ID as a key in a B-tree map because it implements ORD. So here's a handful of different use cases. There's probably more. This is just an example of how a basic type like this can start to proliferate throughout your entire system. And you can start needing to clone it around all the time. You can start needing to store it in all these different data structures. And suddenly the cost of those operations starts to matter and starts to add up. So let's look at the cost of cloning this around and just the, the overall memory footprint of this when we use string. So here's how string is represented. So the actual string data in string is represented as a character buffer that's out on the heap. And string allocates enough memory for your text, obviously, but then also it allocates a little bit of extra space so that it can grow without needing to reallocate. So here we have goblin with four extra bytes of spare capacity in case the string needs to grow anymore. Although we know that it doesn't because goblin is already a monster. Next, the string struct itself is made up of three eight byte words a pointer, a length, and a capacity. Now the pointer just points directly at the string data. The length refers to G-O-B-L-I-N, so it's six, and the capacity includes that extra four bytes at the end, so it's 10. So let's look at what it looks like to clone a string. So first we need to clone the entire character buffer. So first we need to allocate more memory, and then we need to copy over all the characters, which is a linear time operation. In other words, it takes longer the longer your string is. Then we need to create a new string struct on the stack and point it at the new character buffer. Notice that this time we shaved off the extra capacity because strings clone isn't going to over allocate. It's going to give you an exact sized buffer. So we just have this extra spare capacity of six, which isn't really helpful to us right now because it's the same as the length. And if we want to make another clone, we have to do the exact same thing. We need to allocate a new buffer, copy all the characters over once again, and then create a new string struct on the stack that points at it. And again, we have this extra capacity field here that's not really useful to us. So hopefully you can see that this process of allocating new memory, which by the way is very expensive, is a little bit cumbersome. And the string structs are just kind of large and overly bulky just for the simple purpose of talking about goblins. So now let's look at the same situation, but using arcstr instead of string. So with arcstr, we start out with some heap data that looks different. So first we have these two eight byte words. One of them is a strong reference count. The next one is a weak reference count. And then we have our actual string data. So this already looks bigger and kind of strange, but don't worry, it gets better. So our arcs on the stack are just a pointer and a length. They're only 16 bytes because they don't have that extra capacity field that the strings had. So it's just pointing at our reference count out here. And let's look at what happens when we clone. So all we have to do is copy that struct that's on the stack and increment our reference count. So now it's two. You notice we didn't do any kind of memory allocation. We didn't do a deep copy of our string data. We're just referring to the same string data in two places now. So we can very, very cheaply make clones of this. And the fact that this string data is shared between multiple arcs also increases the chance that it's going to be in cache when we look it up because it gets loaded into cache anytime I use any of these four arcs to read from it versus the strings where the memory that they're pointing to would only be in cache if I had already looked it up recently using that specific string. 
So you can see that this whole thing is just much lighter weight. These arcs themselves are smaller, so more of them can fit in the same amount of memory. And frankly, this is just a much smarter use of resources for our immutable string that we're passing around through our program. Also, these two extra words that we're paying for on the heap are divided among every single arc that we have. So they're kind of amortized, whereas we had to pay for an extra word for every string that we used on the stack. These two extra words that are on the heap, yeah, two is more than one, but they're shared among every arc instance we have. So it's much less at the end of the day than that extra word that each and every string had to carry along with it. So let's see what it looks like and feels like if we just plug arcstr directly into our monster ID instead of string. So first of all, all of our derives work exactly how they did. You can clone an arcstr, you can debug print an arcstr, you can compare it, you can hash it, you can also serialize and deserialize it, although you do need to activate a survey feature in order to do that, just because there's some minor small print that you want to read if you want to do that, but it's straightforward and easy to do. So all of that still just works like it did. What about our asstr accessor? This function does not need to change at all because arcstr implements deref stir just like string does. We can just take a reference to it and return that and that turns into a reference to a string slice. So nothing about this function needs to change. It all works perfectly. Next, what about our hash map of monster ID to enemy stats? Well, our monster ID struct still implements eek and hash because arcstr does and so nothing needs to change here and in fact, I would argue that this is way more appropriate to use arcstr for this because string gives you a lot of APIs for modifying the underlying string, but you can't modify a hash map key because you might break the invariance of the data structure. So representing your key using an immutable type like what arcstr gives you is much more appropriate than using string. Moving on. My vec of monster IDs is going to be much more cache efficient now because I've shaved off an entire word from each and every monster ID and is two-thirds the size that it was before. My function for creating an enemy instance out of a monster ID is probably more efficient now because I imagine this involves some kind of cloning of the monster ID, which is much more efficient now that we're using arc. And then lastly, our B-tree map is kind of the same as the hash map. It's just more appropriate to be using immutable data as our key type because you're not allowed to modify the keys in a B-tree map anyway. And this B-tree map is going to be more efficient now because it's storing data that's smaller and doesn't have to pay for the cost of being mutable when it doesn't make sense for it to be mutable. So Arcster wins in all of these examples. It's more efficient and it's a drop-in replacement. So why not just use it? So a takeaway here that I've kind of been hinting at, but I'm going to say explicitly, is that VEC and string are for modifying buffers of stuff. They're for pushing and popping and extending and truncating. And if you don't need that stuff, don't use them because they have some extra cost that's associated with that. So all of the methods on VEC and string that are super interesting, notice that all of these methods take a mute self. So they're all about modifying the buffer and mutating it and changing the shape of it. And if you don't need any of these features, then don't use VEC and string. If you just need to look at some data and say, ask for its length to see if it's empty, index into it, iterate over it, split it, search in it, all of that stuff is provided directly by stir and slice T, both of which you can get at very easily through an arc. And so you don't need the full power of string and VEC if you just need to look at some data and you can gain a lot of performance by not paying for string and VEC if this is all you need. So that's why you might want to use arc slice t over VEC or arc stir over string. Now I do want to show off arc string because I mentioned that it was bad and this is why. So arc string starts off the same way as string does with a buffer with some spare capacity. But then we also need to put a string itself into an arc. So you see we have those extra two words at the front for the reference count. And then the string stuff after that. And then the arc is going to be pointing at that string. And cloning it is going to, yeah, it's going to clone the reference to the string. But you see that if we wanted to get at the actual text that says goblin, we would have to jump to the string and then jump from the string to the goblin. And this whole thing is just kind of cumbersome and awkward. And this is why arc string is not a good idea when we can do much better with arc stir. Lastly, I mentioned that if you do not need to clone, you can do even better than arc by using box stir. And this is essentially as good as you can possibly get, assuming you don't need to clone. So this does not have any extra spare capacity. This just allocates something out on the heap. 
points to it and knows how big it is. So you, you cannot do any better than this. But when you clone, you are doing a deep clone of that heap data. So that's going to be a memory allocation and a linear time copy. But if you're not supporting clone, you can't do any better than this in terms of memory efficiency. So consider box stir if that's your use case. So that's all I got. That's going to do it for this one. Let me know what you think. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.